Russell White Debate, Sunday evening, February 23, 1908. Chairman J.F. Rutherford, Attorney, Boonville, Missouri. First proposition. The scriptures clearly teach that all hope of salvation today is dependent upon accepting the gospel of Christ as revealed in the scriptures and that such acceptance is confined to this present life. L.S. White's Second Speech Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, it affords me great pleasure again to appear before you in defense of the proposition we are discussing at this time, and in all of my experience and observation, I have never heard any man undertake to reply unto an argument that had been made without in some way attempting to take up the argument and show that it did not teach what the man that made it says that it did. This is the course that my opponent pursued in his attempted reply to the many scriptural arguments that I made in my first speech, but it is left with the audience to judge as to whether he answered these arguments or not. I want you to notice a statement that he made just before he closed his speech. He said the object of the gospel age is not to discuss the millennial age. That being true, Elder Russell is not carrying out the object of the gospel age, for he rarely discusses anything else except the millennial age. He could not even keep off from it in his attempt to reply to my argument, notwithstanding we have a proposition or two on that later in this investigation. I will introduce another, two arguments on the affirmative, and then I will answer his speech. 17. God sent His Word for the benefit of the entire human family, Matthew 28, 18-20. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. That will answer an argument that he made. Mark sixteen fifteen through 16 And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Luke 24, 46 through 47 And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead the third day and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in His name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Elder Russell teaches us, It is to be preached just to a few here in this life. Jesus said, Go unto all the world and preach the gospel unto every creature. Jesus, the Son of God, stands here on one hand and says that it is for all the world, for every nation, and for every creature. Elder Russell, another wonderful, powerful, great character, on the other hand, says it is just to be preached to a few. Which will you take? Jesus or my distinguished opponent? You must take one or the other. But Jesus said, Acts 1, 8, But ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth, and only unto a few? No, sir, but unto the uttermost part of the earth. There you have it. Jesus says, Go unto all the world, carry it to the uttermost part of it. My distinguished opponent says, No, but to a little flock. If it be true, as my opponent teaches, that God has not sent His word on any mission to the world, has not even attempted the conversion of the world, as he says in Millennial Dawn, Volume 1, page 95, and that God has evidently designed the permission of evil for 6,000 years, though I do not believe one word of it, but Elder Russell says it and falsely teaches it in Millennial Dawn, Volume 1, page 94, then the people of the world, being without law, are clear of all transgression. Romans 4, 15. Because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. Their unbelief, impentance, and all crimes growing out of them must be excused. If my opponent be correct in his contention, the world is not responsible to God for the crimes of robbery, adultery, murder, and such like, for he has not sent to the world any law forbidding such crimes, even if he be correct, if God has not yet even attempted the conversion of the world. 
it is not His will that the world should now be converted, and it is therefore God's will that all evil associated with non-conversion must be allowed to run its course throughout this life with impunity, for no divine attempt has been shown against it, since the people of the world go into the grave without receiving any law from God, they die without condemnation. According to Elder Russell's theory, are not lost when they die, will not be lost when they are raised from the dead, unless they become lost while in their graves. As he paid no attention to the questions I asked him in my former speech, I want him to pay some attention to these questions now. 1. How are people lost without law from God? 2. How do they die lost without any law from God? 3. How will they be raised from the dead lost? 4. If they are not lost while living, are not lost at death, are not lost in the grave, and will not be lost when resurrected from the grave, how can they then be saved? 5. How can a man who is not lost when he dies in the gospel age be saved when raised from the dead in the millennial age? 18. Mark 3.28-29 Jesus saith, Verily I say unto you, All sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. Or, as expressed by Matthew, he hath never forgiven us, neither in this world nor in the world to come. What is the sin against the Holy Ghost? Jesus said, If they blaspheme against God or sin against God, they can be saved. If they sin against the Holy Spirit, there is no forgiveness, neither in this world nor in the world to come. Why? Because the people might reject God's offered terms of mercy, and still Jesus was coming to teach them, while alive, salvation. While Jesus was here on earth preaching the gospel and to them, he was offering them salvation. They might reject it and still be saved, because the Holy Spirit was coming and going to reveal unto them the complete and full plan of salvation, which would be God's last revelation, and consequently their last chance. And so when they rejected the teaching of God's eternal spirit, it was their last chance, and there was no salvation for them, neither in this world nor in the world to come. Here you have it. Certain characters. Jesus says there is no forgiveness for them, neither in this world nor in the world to come. My distinguished opponent says that these very characters that Jesus said there is no forgiveness for, they will have a fresh trial of a thousand years after this life is over. I do not believe a word of it, because there is not a word of it true. Now, I want to follow his speech in the order that he delivered it. And we are going to have some debating now for the next 20 minutes. I am in the lead. I was in the affirmative. The first thing I did was to put Elder Russell in the affirmative. He turned right around and affirmed a proposition instead of replying to my affirmative argument. He is now in the affirmative. The laboring oar is his. I am going to follow in the negative the balance of his speech. I will be willing, so far as the argument of this proposition is concerned, to leave it with the judgment of these good and intelligent people, for you know that he utterly and absolutely failed to answer those forty or fifty strong scriptures that I gave you in support of the argument that there would be no chance of salvation after death, for the only chance was confined unto this life. He said that he did not deny there is a trial in this present life. Certainly he does not deny that, but why affirm something that God says nothing about? The essence, he says, of the argument is that God has a plan of salvation. I fully agree with him that God has a plan of salvation, and that plan of salvation was given by the Lord Jesus Christ. I showed you in my affirmative argument that Jesus Christ came once into the presence of the people to offer them this plan of salvation and then went back into the presence of God to intercede for the people. And he is standing there in the presence of God for the people, and if they will come unto God by him, now he is able to save them. Hebrews 7.25 Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Mark you, he did not say that he will be in the millennial age, but he is now. He said nearly all these scriptures relate to this world. They relate to the plan of salvation that Jesus Christ prepared and offered to the human family and show that if we do not accept them in this world, 
we will have no chance to accept them in the world to come. He said that I said the kingdom of God has come, but he said that it had not come in Allegheny, Pennsylvania, his own home. I know that if he is the only one that ever preaches there, it never will come there. But I am going to investigate a little bit and see whether the kingdom of God has come or not. Luke 12:32. Jesus said, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, not some little flock away down the age, but those people back there that Jesus was talking to on that occasion, that God was going to give them the kingdom of God. In Mark 9, 1, Jesus used this strong language, and he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that there will be some of them that stand here, which shall not taste of death, till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. Elder Russell said it has not come yet. Jesus Christ said there were people standing there that he was then talking to that should not taste death till they had seen the kingdom of God come with power. Then there is one of three things true. The kingdom of God came during the lifetime of the generation that was living when Jesus used that language, or some of them are living till the present time, or Jesus Christ was mistaken about what he said. And of course, we are all agreed that Jesus Christ was not mistaken about what he said. But was the kingdom of God in existence soon after that time? I turn your attention to Colossians 1.13, where Paul says, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, twenty-five years after Jesus Christ used that language, the kingdom of God was in existence here on this earth? and people had been translated into that kingdom, Elder Russell, to the contrary, notwithstanding. But my opponent says that Jesus Christ is the propitiation for our sins, for the sins of the church, and also the whole world. He did not tell us where it was, but Jesus Christ tells us that He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ourselves only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Notice carefully that he says Jesus Christ is the propitiation for our sins. He does not say that he will be when he comes again the propitiation for our sins, but he says that he is now, not will be, the propitiation for our sins. Then he admits that the world is called to repentance, but not called to be the bride of Christ. Strange logic indeed. Revelation 22:17, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whomsoever will, let him take the water of life freely. I thank God that the invitation of the gospel of Christ stands out just as broad and just as wide as whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Acts 2.38 Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 1.47 the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. If Elder Russell had been there, he would have said, Look here, Peter, you are mistaken about this thing. This gospel is only to go to a very few, the little flock. You have it wrong when you extend it to everybody and open wide the door of salvation for the whole human family. But he had a little something to say about that elect class, furnishing me just about text enough in that speech that I can preach the gospel to you in this one. I will notice the elect class for just a moment. Second Thessalonians 2.13 But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. Will my opponent answer this question? Does God elect people unto eternal salvation independent of their wills, of their volition, or independent of anything they may do in this life? Or does He elect them to salvation, as the Bible says, through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth? Then He said that God in the present time is taking the little flock, but He is not taking the world. He is only taking the little flock, that the message is just to the little flock. Well, you know, great men sometimes differ. Paul, a great man, on one side differed very seriously from my distinguished opponent, and other great men on the other side. Acts 17.30 And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. If Elder Russell had been there, he would have said, Paul, 
you have that thing wrong. Jesus Christ did not send his gospel to anybody but the little flock. And here you have the cheek to stand before the wicked people of Athens, idolatrous people, and tell them that God commanded all men everywhere to repent. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. That will remove that argument for all time to come. Jesus Christ did send his gospel to the whole human family, not merely to this little flock that you are going to hear so much about during this investigation. Jesus Christ said that all authority in heaven and in earth was given to him, and by virtue of all the authority in heaven and on earth, he sent his disciples to teach all nations, every creature of all nations. Elder Russell says that he has only sent them to teach a few, a little flock, there have never been but three sources of power, and they are heaven, earth, and hell. But by all power and authority of heaven and earth, Jesus sent his disciples to teach all nations, every creature of every nation, and the doctrine that says this will only be given unto a few and not the whole human family came from hell and not from Jesus Christ. Mark sixteen fifteen through 16 Jesus said unto them, Go into all the world, not merely to the little flock, but go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Jesus did not put those words in little flock. It is my opponent that does that. He also said that God hath blindeth the people. Admitting for argument's sake for a moment that God hath blinded the people, I want to show you that these folks that are blinded are the very ones that perish. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 through 4. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. It is the God of this world, not Jehovah God, that will have blinded the minds of the people, and the people have a right to investigate the gospel. They have a right to turn from sin, they have a right to judge themselves worthy or unworthy of everlasting life just as they please. And a man that will not judge himself worthy of everlasting life in this world will not judge himself worthy of everlasting life in the world to come. Acts 13.46 Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. But seeing ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, Lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Here we may have the actual example where people judge themselves unworthy of everlasting life. But he tells us that 1,200 million heathens are in darkness and that God will open their eyes. I want to say to you, furthermore, that according to such preaching as he is doing, they will remain in darkness, for there is nothing about his preaching to inspire the people of God to carry the glorious light of the gospel of Jesus Christ unto them. His doctrine is the doctrine of procrastination. Someone has said that procrastination is the thief of time. It can be as truly said that procrastination is the thief of souls. And I charge it upon him this evening that the doctrine that he is preaching is calculated to make people procrastinate this matter, to put it off and let the heathen go until a chance after this life. But how does God propose that their eyes shall be opened? Acts 26:18 to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Jesus Christ appeared to Paul to make an apostle of him, to send him afar hence unto the Gentiles, not to my opponent's little flock, but far hence unto the Gentiles. For what? To open their eyes." Hold on, Paul, here is a great man down here that says you are wrong about that, that you must not open their eyes. You must go and preach to the little flock. It is not harmony with the word of God that you are preaching to them. You must preach to the little flock. But no, Paul went on and opened their eyes. Jesus Christ said, open their eyes to turn them from darkness to the light, 
and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive their forgiveness of sins and inheritance among that that were sanctified by faith which is in me. Here the gospel is preached to this people that they may hear, so that they might believe it, that they might obey it, and that they might receive forgiveness of sins here in this life, Elder Russell to the contrary notwithstanding. Furthermore, on this same point of their being blind, Matthew 13:15, Jesus said, For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. So they close their eyes, they stop their ears, God does not do it. And such preaching as my opponent is doing is not only calculated to keep the eyes of the heathen closed and their ears stopped, but actually it is calculated to cause Christian people here in this land of gospel, light and liberty, to close their eyes and stop their ears and rest in their imagination about that dreamy state that he talks about after death, when there is not one word of it taught in the word of God. But he tells us about that due time. He seems to have a due bill that is coming due some day for all here. When was that due him? Our Savior would have all to be saved. Elder Russell says just a few. Paul says all men to be saved, all to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Elder Russell says no, just the little flock must come under the knowledge of truth. Paul says 1 Timothy 2, 5 through 6, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. When was the due time? In all these prophecies concerning the coming of Christ in this world to prepare salvation there, the due time had come. Jesus Christ came into the world in fulfillment of these prophecies, and there was a due time, not yet to come. For he says that we are to be heirs according to the promise made to Abraham. Galatians 3:26 through 27 for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you have been baptized and to Christ have put on Christ. C.T. Russell's Second Reply My opponent, dear friends, would seem to imply by his last argument that he is urging that God is going to save the whole world and that I am trying to make out that God is not going to try and save any except the elect. Now, the very reverse is true. The very reverse is true. Our brother's contention is that only those who are saved now are saved at all, and that the only ones who are saved now are the elect, and that others who are not the elect and who are not saved now will never be saved. That is his argument. But now the very reverse is true, dear friends. How easy it is to put the matter wrong. Let us take this text that he quoted us last. He will have all men to be saved. God will have all men to be saved, to come to a knowledge of the truth. Have those heathen come to a knowledge of the truth? Those twelve hundred million today, have they come to a knowledge of the truth? Our brother quotes from our brother Paul that God will have all men to come to a knowledge of the truth. They cannot be saved without a knowledge of the truth. Those twelve hundred million are lost unless they come to a knowledge of the truth in this gospel age. If this gospel is hidden to them that are lost, the heathen are lost. It is hidden to them. They do not see the gospel. They cannot see the gospel as he quoted it a while ago. Again, the God of this world has blinded the minds of those that believe not. I trust that it was unintentional that he misrepresented me as saying that our God had blinded their minds. I never said that, dear friends. I said that our God must have permitted it, or it would not have been. But the scriptures say that I hold that it is the devil who has blinded their minds, the God of this world, your adversary, the devil, the one who is by and by to be bound that he may deceive the nations no more. The word nations in the Greek is the same as the word heathen. He should be bound that he may deceive the heathen no more. He is deceiving the heathen now, and even a great many that are not so heathenish. A good many of us have been under his influence to some extent. As the Apostle Paul says, speaking of those who are of the Church of Christ, I pray God for you, that the eyes of your understanding may be opened, that you may be able to comprehend with all saints the length and breadth, the height and depth, that ye may know the love of God that passeth all understanding, the love of God that loves the whole world. 
the love of God that has made a plan of salvation that is worldwide, the love of God that takes in every member of Adam's race, the love of God that has provided a second chance for every man. I am not giving that as scripture that God has provided a second chance for every man, but I will prove to you that it is scripture, that the Lord shows the whole race was lost when Father Adam was condemned, and you were condemned, and I was condemned, the whole race was condemned. That was the first chance that was lost. Did not you have a chance in Eden when Father Adam was on trial as your representative? And did not I have a chance there too? And were not all of our chances lost, every man's chance lost? Now then, dear friends, it is because God proposes that there should be another chance that he has sent his son to redeem the world, and his son has paid the price for Adam, and has paid the price for every man that we shall be saved. It shall be testified in due time that every man shall have an opportunity to come to a knowledge of the truth, that he may be saved. The heathen are not saved on account of their ignorance. Nobody is saved except by faith in the Son of God by the terms that are laid down in the Scriptures, which I repeat at the present time are the terms that our Lord mentioned. Straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. That is the class, and the only class, that find it. And those that find that narrow path are but a little flock, and have always been a little flock. You know it, and everybody knows it. We will take up some of these other arguments. Our brother has suggested that the kingdom of Christ has already been established, but the Apostle Paul did not think so. The Apostle Paul said, I would to God, and ye did reign. He says, You appear to reign as kings without us. I would to God, you did reign. If you reigned, then we would also reign with you. I am quoting Paul to the Corinthians. Our brother cites as a proof of this that Christ's kingdom has come. He says there be some standing here which shall not taste death until they see the kingdom of God come. But the very next verse reads, And three days after this he taketh Peter and James and John up into the mountain, and he was transfigured before them, and his face shone, and his garments glistened. He there gave them a picture of the kingdom, an illustration of the kingdom, an illustration that the apostle Peter recognized. For afterwards, writing in one of his epistles, he says, we have not followed cunningly, devised fables, when we declared unto you the power and coming of our Lord's kingdom. For we are eyewitnesses for his coming, when we were with him in the holy mountain. But he says, We have a more sure word of prophecy, to which we do well that we take heed, much more sure than that vision which Peter says he saw in the holy mountain. They did see a vision of the kingdom. It was an illustration of the kingdom. But the apostles all held that the kingdom was to come, and they desired they might have a share in that kingdom. And, dear friends, it is yet to come, for we have not the kingdom of Christ. We have, perhaps, the best government under the sun today, but if this is the kingdom of Christ, then I am greatly disappointed. If all these kingdoms of Europe that are raising their large armies and making their great guns and battleships to blow one another out of existence, if these are Christ's kingdom that we have been waiting and praying for, then it is too bad, and we are all greatly perplexed and lost in our calculations. But let us take the right view of the matter. The Lord is selecting a kingdom class. He is selecting a church to constitute his kingdom in his due time. This selection is now going on because those who are now called are to be heirs of the kingdom. Mark the term, heirs of the kingdom. An heirship is something that you have not got. It is something that is coming, that you are heir to. It implies that we have not yet got it. We are heirs of the kingdom, called out with that very object before our minds, invited to reign in this way. Mark his words, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me on my throne, even as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Have you overcome yet? Have you sat down with him on his throne? No, when you sit down, he says he will grant us power over the nations. It will be part of the work of the glorified church to judge the world. Know ye not that the saints shall judge the world? The unworthy have not had their judgment yet. Judgment belongs to the future. The millennial day is the judgment day of the world. Now is the judgment day of the church. You are on trial now, and I am. 
your ears have heard the blessed message that Christ shall reconcile the world and to himself in due time. But now your ears, which hear in advance of the world, bring responsibilities to you, and they bring a privilege to you and to me, the privilege of this high calling, this heavenly calling. The apostle says the kingdom of Christ is to bring in the time a restitution. The word restitution is connected with the fall. The fall was the time of the loss of those glorious things that God gave Father Adam. He was created in the image of God, and by sin he fell under the sentence of death, and it involved mental and moral decrepitude and decay. The whole world is thus involved. They are all sinners. The scriptures say that you and I are born in sin and shaped in iniquity. So the whole world is in this condition of sin. But the ultimate work of Christ will be to bring so many of them as will back by restitution to the glorious condition from which they fell representatively in Adam. Mark you the Apostle Peter's words on this subject in Acts 3.19, where he says, Times of refreshing shall come, the millennial age, and he shall send Jesus Christ, a second coming of Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heavens must receive, and must retain until when? Until the times of restitution of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. God has been telling about this restitution time all the way down through the prophets. When you once learn to read it in your Bible, you will see the restitution message all through it, that God has promised a glorious restoration of mankind back to the original pristine glory of the image of God, when the earth, instead of being as it is today, shall come back to its Edenic condition. That is the promise of God for the salvation of the world. But before the world can reach that condition, it must have it through judgment, through discipline. And as the Lord is now judging and disciplining the church in this gospel age, so in the millennial age, which shall be the trial and discipline of the world, it shall be blessed when their eyes are opened, when they shall have the privilege of coming back to God, those in the world who shall be faithful in the disciplining when their eyes are opened, when they see the privilege granted them of coming back to harmony with God through the blessed Son, and of going up the highway of holiness. If then they prove faithful, if then they obey, to them then shall be the blessing of restitution. They shall go back upon the highway of holiness. As the prophet says, he says, No lion shall be there, no ravenous beast. But today we have the narrow way which Bunyan so well pictured when he said concerning Christian's faith that in some places he came to such a narrow path that he could hardly pass. And again he saw the lions coming out to devour him, and he could merely pass through faith between them. He was well illustrating the narrow way that few find and still fewer are willing to walk in after they find it the narrow way that leads to glory and immortality, that leads to the heavenly kingdom and joint heirship with Christ. That is the way it is pictured in the prophecy. Highway shall be there, and a way. It shall be called a way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. The redeemed of the Lord will go up therein. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast. No beast of strong drink and passion will be there to hinder, all those passions and vile things of the present time that constitute the devouring beasts that surround us, these will all be put under restraint, and Satan, our great adversary, shall be restrained at that time. You say it will be a more favorable time for them than it is for us. I answer that so far as that part is concerned, perhaps they will have an advantage over us. But would you not like to see the world having a good, reasonable time and getting eternal life? Would you not like to have their eyes opened? Must they have their eyes closed as long as you had yours closed? Must they have had all the trials that you have had? Why should they? I answer that these trials of the church in this present time are especially to prune and select the little flock. Our dear brother has represented that I am teaching that the message of God is only to the little flock. I said nothing of that kind, my dear friends. I said that the message of God is a worldwide message that all will ultimately hear it, but that now only a few could hear it. Why? Because the God of this world hath blinded their minds and stopped their ears. So the scriptures say, 
But when that time comes, all the blinded eyes shall be opened, and all the deaf ears shall be unstopped. My dear friends, it is some of this doctrine that our dear brother has been preaching that has been doing some of this blinding. I am sorry to say that although Christianity has done a great deal of good, that it is picturing our God as the very greatest monster that was ever known in the world, take, if you please, what the heathen think about God. Some of them fancy that the future resurrection is punishment. They think of God as being a great devil. All the heathen think of God as being a great devil. None of them ever knew about a God of love. They have various theories amongst them, respecting this great devil who has so much power over them. But it remains for the Bible, the word of God, to declare a God of love. Strange to say, our great adversary, the devil, has blinded our eyes to such an extent that we cannot see, and have not been able to clearly see in the past the grace of God that bringeth salvation, hath appeared unto all men, teaching all men that denying ungodly lust we should live soberly. But whom doth it teach? Where is it taught? Has it taught all men? No. Why not? They have not heard it. How can they hear without a preacher? How can you be on trial without hearing the message? The Bible's argument, you see, is right to the point. They cannot hear. They have no responsibility when they have not heard. They cannot be condemned to the second death without first having heard. It is different with us. For as the Apostle points out, if we have tasted of the good word of God and had been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, if we should fall away, there remaineth no more sacrifice for our sins. We are not all yet heathen by any manner of means. We rejoice who have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit. But has everybody in Cincinnati been made partakers of the Holy Spirit? No, not even everybody in this house, perhaps, have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit. It is those only who have been once enlightened. But how many have been enlightened? I tell you, dear friends, that the whole world lieth in darkness, and Christendom too, respecting the true character of God. I must take up as many as possible of the different points that our brother has made. All power is given unto you. Go ye therefore, and teach all nations. Did he say all nations would believe? No. Who will believe? He that hath an ear to hear, and a heart to obey. How many will there be? Only a few. How many today, dear friends, do you know who are disciples of Christ? You do not know very many. Did Jesus ever say he was to convert the world? By no means. What then? What does the Apostle Peter say? He said, God at first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them the people for his name. What did Peter say that God did? He said, he did not visit the Gentiles to take in all the Gentiles. He did not visit the Gentiles to make them a little flock or to take them to glory, but he visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name, to gather out of them that little flock. The message goes to the whole world, but only a few of the world at the present time are people to hear by reason of the gross darkness and the defiling influence of the great adversary. Only a few now can hear. The great masses are blind and deaf, some of them in the gross darkness of heathenism, and many of them in great darkness even in Cincinnati, Pittsburgh, and every other part of the civilized world in gross darkness as respects God. They will study politics and finance and everything else except to know God. They are not much interested in intelligently knowing God. It is only a few that have an interest in looking into God and His Word and studying what they teach. Our brother speaks of God giving law unto the world. The scriptures say nothing about God giving the law unto the world. God gave law to Israel 1,600 years before Christ came. He gave a law to Israel out of the mouth of Moses, but he did not give that law to the other nations. The other nations were without hope in the world, as the Bible says. And when it came to the gospel time, our Lord, as the apostle says, broke down the middle wall of the partition so that the Jews should no longer have a preference or distinction above the Gentiles. Then the gospel message went to every creature. That did not mean that every creature would hear, but it meant that there was no longer a distinction to be made. He was to no longer single out the Jew and say that the message of God is only for the Jew. 
it was henceforth to be given to everybody who hath an ear to hear. And that is what you and I do. But we do not confine our message to the Jews. We do not confine it to some particular nationality. The Lord said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. But does everybody hear? No. Is everybody able to hear? No. Why not? The God of this world hath blinded them. Will he always blind them? No. The time will come when Satan shall be bound and will deceive and blind the nations no more until the thousand years of Christ's reign are finished. Then he shall be loosed for a little season, we are told. Meantime, that will be the period of Christ's reign, for he must reign until he hath put all enemies under his feet. Our brother would have us understand that Christ has been reigning for the last 1,800 years. How many enemies has he under his feet now, do you think? He must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet, and the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. I tell you, dear friends, he is not reigning. There are not any of them put under his feet. Those that are under Christ are those that have come under voluntarily, as you did and as I did. Because of hearing the message of the gospel, we have gladly presented our bodies a living sacrifice. By and by he shall reign. He shall put down all opposition, everything contrary to God, and he will reign for a thousand years, the scriptures say. In that time he will subdue everything, and unto him every knee shall bow, and every tongue confess. Look for a moment to see how much prospect there is of our dear brother converting the heathen. He seemed to give us the impression that he is going to convert the heathen. I wish he would. I would give him all that I have now and everything that I ever expect to have on earth if he would convert the heathen. But my dear friends, what do we know about the heathen? We know that a century ago there were 600 million heathen. Today there are twice as many, 1,200 million. Our brother is not getting along very fast converting the heathen, is he? Why don't he convert the heathen? He is not to blame, and nobody else is to blame except the God of this world who has stopped their ears and blinded their minds. Why does he have the power? He could not have the power unless God permitted it. Will God always permit it? God answers no. He answers that when he shall have accomplished his purpose of taking out the elect, known as the little flock, then the reign of sin shall have ended. Then Satan shall no longer be the prince of this world. Then Jesus shall be the prince of this world, the prince of light, the prince of glory, and the kingdom of God's dear Son will come, and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is what we are waiting on, dear friends. Our brother says that the world was lost without God's law. I answer yes, the whole world was lost. The whole world is still lost. They are not found yet. Are they not still lost? Of course they are lost. They are still under the sentence of death, just as they were at first. They are under the same sentence of death that they were when Adam first transgressed. All the children of Adam came under that sentence. Dying, thou shalt die. You have no right to eternal life. That penalty of death has come to the whole world, and the only ones who are saved are those who have accepted Christ, as illustrated by Noah and his family getting into the ark, which the Apostle Peter says is a like figure whereunto baptism doth even now save us. But shall the whole world ever have an opportunity? Shall their ears even hear? Not certainly in the present life. Of the 200,000 millions that have gone down in the tomb, or approximately that, the great mass of them never even heard of Jesus. They were not saved. They were all lost. But my dear friends, Jesus Christ, by the grace of God, tasted death for every man, for every one of them, yes, just as much as for you and for me. He tasted death for every member of Adam's race. As by men came death, by a man also comes the resurrection of the dead. For as all in Adam die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. The time is coming when all those who have gone down without a knowledge of the Lord shall be brought to a knowledge of the truth. That is what the scriptures teach. Quoting again from the scriptures our brother referred to, it says, There is one God and one mediator between God and men, not a mediator between God and the church. You do not need a mediator to come in between you and God. The Father himself loveth you. You and I do not need a mediator. 
we need an advocate. The church needs an advocate. So the scriptures say, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, who hath appeared in the presence of God for us in our behalf as our advocate or attorney. We do not need a mediator. Mediators are necessary when there are two in opposition. God is only in opposition because the world is in a condition of sin. And God says he cannot receive the world while they are in alienation and loving unrighteousness. And the world says, we do not love God. They think of God from the standpoint that our brother has been misrepresenting him as a revengeful God, as being a very devil who planned their eternal torment before he created them, one who is keeping them in ignorance and laying pitfalls to blind them and take them to eternal torment. That is the kind of doctrine that has made infidels, and that is what is keeping the heathen from approaching more nearly to Christ. We have a missionary in China who writes me that he has been telling them something of the truth over there. He says those who have been hearing Presbyterianism and Methodism are coming to him and saying, Tell us more about the love of God. They call it the Jesus Doctrine, as distinguished from Presbyterianism, Methodism, and so forth. They want to hear some more of the Jesus Doctrine. Dear friends, if the world could hear the Jesus Doctrine, it would be a blessed thing for them. Many hearts are moved by the love of God that will never be moved by thinking of God as the great devil who has made a place in hell for them, where there are a thousand fireproof devils ready to receive 999 out of every thousand that are not of the elect, that are not of the little flock. Now that is the doctrine that has kept people away from God. That is the doctrine of devils the apostle speaks of. Nothing has done more than that doctrine to harden the hearts of men and make them abhor the word of God and turn them from himself. So if you try to talk religion to a man, he immediately thinks of devils, and he does not want anything to do with you. He thinks it is bad enough to die, and if he is a Catholic to go through purgatory, or a Protestant to eternal torment, which is worse? He thinks he is in a bad condition anyway. He has no hope of being one of the saints. He knows the Bible promises reward to no one at this time but the little flock who walk in the footsteps of Jesus, who lay aside every weight and run with patience the race set before them, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Now, there is a difference between the one gospel and the other. Our gospel is the one which is for the world and all mankind. It holds strictly with the scriptures, first of all, that Jesus is is the true light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He is the true light. Every man must yet see this great light. The world is going down, nevertheless, without seeing that light. Thousands of millions have gone into the great prison house of death without seeing God or knowing Jesus at all. He gave himself a ransom for all, which must be testified in due time to every man. If it has been testified to every man now, then this is your due time to make your calling and election sure. Seek to enter at the straight gate. Straight is the gate, and narrow is the way. If this is not your due time, and if you do not hear now, or whoever does not hear now, in the sense not merely of hearing with his outer ear, but with the ear of his heart, so as to understand the message of God's grace, whoever does not get that hearing ear in the present time, is not in the same responsibility that you and I are who have had that hearing ear. Blessed are those that hear. Our brother has quoted that God is able to save to the uttermost all those that come unto the Father by him. Yes, he is able to save. Not only able to save us at the present time, but he is able to save those that have gone down into the prison house of death without a knowledge of his dear Son. He is able to bring the light of the knowledge of God to every creature. He tells us that the knowledge of that time is to come when under the whole heavens the knowledge of God shall fill the whole earth, and every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. Then shall there be no need for any one to say to his neighbor, Know the Lord now, because all will know the Lord, from the least of them to the greatest, saith the Lord. Our brother calls our attention to the Jews. He says that they had one chance and lost it. He knows something about chances that I do not know everything about. I find, according to the scriptures, there was one chance in Eden, and that was lost, and that Christ Jesus tasted death for every man, and that Christ dies no more for every man, 
and therefore by the death of Christ there is one chance secured for every creature. You have your chance, and I have my chance, and every heathen man must have his chance, because that is what Christ died for. He died to give every man a chance, and they will get it, not as one that is bound. You will admit that the heathen have not got it now. They are lost. They will be lost until they hear the message, and they cannot hear that message till the prince of this world is bound, until their ears are opened, and until the message of the Lord's grace goes forth, and the knowledge of the Lord shall fill the whole earth, the knowledge of the glory of God. That is the way it reads in one place. If our gospel is hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Yes, indeed, and that is to the whole world. The whole world is lost. Our gospel is hid to them nearly all. It is only to a few that it is not hid. It is hid to a good many, even in civilized lands, the true gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel of which we are not ashamed. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, which is the power of God of salvation to every one that believeth. I would be ashamed of the gospel of damnation. The word gospel means good tidings, as the angel preaches. Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be unto all people. All the people are going to hear these good tidings. The heathen will get them in good time, that is, the millennial time. You and I have got the good tidings now at the present time. We will have a severe test in the narrow way. Tis difficult to walk in the footprints of Jesus, but we have offered to us exceeding great and precious promises that by these we may become partakers of the divine nature, which will be restitution back to human perfection. But the salvation that God is now offering to the little flock whom he is now selecting as the joint heirs of Jesus Christ is glory, honor, and immortality to sit with him in his throne, to be associated with him in blessing all mankind. Dear brethren and sisters, this is the gospel of which we are not ashamed. I have yet to find a man that is not ashamed of the ordinary misnamed gospel of damnation, which makes out that God is the one responsible for nearly the whole world going to eternal torment. That is a misfit name. No gospel about that. That is damnation in every sense of the word. God has a glorious gospel of His dear Son, a gospel of love, a gospel of redemption, a gospel of the high calling of the church, a gospel of the restitution of the world and all mankind. Let us rejoice therein.